it's not, um, there's no moving parts. No, actually, actually, sequoias are the only, they're the only species that can actually absorb water through their uh, leaves. Mm -hmm. They they evolve that way. That's why they, they're able to take the moisture from the uh, from the log. They're also a community too. You know, sequoia trees. You know, actually share the same root system, yeah. so they can rescue each other. You know, if one tree is in trouble, the other ones can rescue it. Uh, it's completely resistant to bugs. You know, because they have a lot of that. Uh, what do you call that stuff in the tree bark? No. Is it called? Yeah, that stuff. <laughs> yeah, tannin. It has a lot of tannin in it. And bugs, you know, just cannot penetrate. And then the last part about you know all these trees is they need fire, forest fire, to survive. Well, see, that's, um, a big, that's a big issue with fire suppression. In yep. Though. Yep. For the longest time, they were suppressing forest fires, and they could not find any new sequoia trees. It's like, what's happening here? I'm giving you, you know, the protection of fire, and how come there's nothing happening? As it turns out, you know, sequoia trees will not release their seed unless there's a forest fire. And the forest fire is nice because it clear out you know, the, everything below. You know, everything turns into ash except for sequoia trees because they have the, their bark is so thick it doesn't really affect them much. So in addition to being 2,000 year old, 300 foot tall trees, they're sure. fireproof. They are, year old, they are pretty trees. much fireproof except for the really super intense fire because of you know, not having regular smaller uh, forest fires. And that's just amazing. That is just, you know, crazy. Well, but even crazy. that's our fault. Hmm? I mean, the, the super intense fires are a result of us yes. doing fire suppression. So, I mean, without that, they're just kind of basically trees. That's why I really like the idea of uh, controlled fires, controlled burns. Those seem like a really good idea. Because otherwise, you get this buildup of just flammable material. It's just going to be a really long Stockpiling. It's called stockpiling. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, the thing is, though, nowadays, because there's so much undergrowth and just years of fire suppressions, uh, they can't just let it burn through because then it would just be a you know, huge fire, right? Fire caliber, so they have to clear everything out and yep. let it burn small. Yep. So let's try to relate that to this class, okay? Do you think there is any relationship between forest fire like that, what, what we just, what we were just talking about? to this class. I don't know how you're going to do it, but I look forward to watching you do it. <laughs> well, I think it has a lot to do with this class because what if you have the ability to simulate, you know, based on weather condition um, and also, you know, what you already know about the stockpiling of, you know, firewood, you know, dead branches and stuff like that, um, the landscape, you know, slopes and whatnot. What if you can write a program that can model forest fire? In other words, you put in all the factors, everything that you can collect, okay? Data is cheap now, okay? You know, we can have sensors of almost every single kind and make massive amounts of these sensors. So what if you have all that information and you combine all that information and you put it into a system, okay? And then you can say, okay, is today a good day to start a control burn, okay? Uh, my objective is to get, get rid of this much you know, biomass you know, within this region here. And the question is, is today a good day to you know, do a control burn? If so, where do I start the fire and what should I be watching out for? Okay. What if the system can come back and say, yes, today is a good day for a control burn, and if you start a fire here, this is the, this is the anticipated affected area. And within this area, the fire intensity will be like this much. I have no idea how they measure fire intensity, but I'm, I, I'll bet you there's a standard okay, to measure that. So oh, what, if, like what if you can do that? What if you can model that? Would that be useful? Absolutely. And if they can model that, what else can they model? Just about anything. Yep, exactly. So that is not, you know, it, it's not something that I'm just throwing out because you know, we were talking about something that's off topic and I want to kind of pull everyone's attention back into this class because there, it represents job opportunity. But those are not jobs for people with just a computer science degree. What other type of degree do you think you might you think might be helpful in modeling? Whatever degree it is that studies how fires burn forests. That would be one, okay, but that may not be a hundred percent necessary. It's actually applied math. Okay? Differential equations, okay? That's always with the math 
degrees. It's always the math people, yes. Okay? But with an applied math degree on one hand and a computer science degree on the other hand, um, then you can look at the data. Basically, you can look at you know, raw data collected from actual for, uh, control burns and then come up with your own model. You can even train a system you know, by observing you know, burns okay, you know, that are started by humans, but with a lot of sensors you know, observing the burn. And you know, technically speaking, a system can learn from you know, actual you know, burns, and it can figure out, OK, this is how fire can, spri can spread, um, and this is how wind direction and wind intensity can change all that stuff. And as a result, you, know, you may not even have to you know, put in a lot of the equations by hand, but you know, just you know, feed a lot of data, a lot of history of burns you know, through the system. It can train itself. Um, we already have stuff like that. We already have self-training systems that can train from experience or you know, basically past data. Um, the, only the only question is what do you apply it to? The stock market? You can almost right? uh, apply it to like viral memetic stuff. Sorry? You can almost apply it to viral memetic stuff. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep you can they, they apply this kind of stuff to uh, disease spread as well. You know, like you know, if, you, if there's a release of some kind of you know, really nasty flu virus, you know, how quickly can it spread and what would be the pattern of the spread? Um, they model the, that kind of stuff as well. Sorry? There's a video game about it. Well, a lot of the video, some of the video games that you play may not be a video game at all. They found that the, the, there were some problems in physics that the, the physicists were trying to solve. And they could not solve it. Okay, it involves a lot of you know computation power, or the problem itself is really complicated. And somehow they recast the entire problem into a video game, and then just released the video game for gamers to play. And then they solved the problem you know pretty quickly. There's another great example of that. It's more of an example in crowdsourcing. So they they wanted to uh, study protein folding, mm -hmm. and so they made a program where you essentially just play with this model of protein. That must be the one that I was talking about. Oh, is it? Yeah. They did that with uh, star mapping as well. Star mapping? Yeah, they just had like, like you, they'll, I think you can still do this. They show you slides and you can like try and pick out whatever they're looking for. Mm -hmm. I think like, uh, it's some, it's some programs in NASA, and, you know, same principle. It's just tons of people like, oh, this one little game. Yeah. <laughs> And now they can track all the satellites, and they have to control that information because now you know organizations where do, we are not exactly friendly with can now detect. You know, <coughs> okay, you know I know when the spy satellites will fly over this region, so hide everything. You know, bring all the tarp out. <laughs> <coughs> Better be some fancy tarp with the yeah. way these uh, satellites are getting. That's what I've been uh, reading. Is you know they can now pick up you know with, with really really high resolution from orbit. And that's actually thanks to uh, the Hubble telescope. And it's closely related to this class again. Just okay. about everything is related to Exactly. But doesn't that really tell you something? I mean, uh, when they first launched the Hubble telescope, the outer space you know, telescope, uh, the optics of the telescope was flawed. Okay? In other words, you know, they did not make one of the components of the telescope correctly. And the captured images were blurry. It's like, Oh, no, we just spent all this money, put this telescope into outer space, and all we can get are these blurry images. Um, so it was expensive. Okay? You know, they could not really send a space shuttle, recapture the telescope, get it back on the ground, fix it, and then send it back up again. That would cost a lot of money. And in the process, they probably would destroy the telescope because it was not designed to withstand you know, the vibration and all the other nasty stuff that happens with, for reentry. So what they did was interesting. They figure out you know, what exactly was the flaw, flaw of the optics because it's not a random flaw. This is a design flaw. Okay, so they know exactly what the flaw was, and what they did was they reverse the function. Remember our inverse function thing? They did an inverse function on the blur <laughs> of the optics. So when they capture a blurry image, they were able to quote unquote reverse the image back into the sharp image because they know exactly what was causing the image to blur. And for the longest time, that's how they do it. That's how they did it. That's how they fixed you know, the, the blurry images back into a sharp image uh, when they were captured from the uh, Hubble telescope. Is it still using the flawed lens? Hmm? I do not know. They actually sent a few missions up there to fix certain things you know, on the telescope. 
um, the last mission of the last um, space shuttle was, I think, you know, on a mission to repair the Hubble telescope. There's a depressing sentence, the last mission of the last space shuttle. Yes. <laughs> well, it was just too expensive, you know, for what it does. You know, there were, uh, there are um, less expensive options to do the same thing now. Including private options these days. <coughs> Yep. I remember the hearing about the, the Dragon X rocket that uh, made it into orbit. Yeah, a, a lot of people can now make it into orbit. Yep. All right. So getting back into subroutines after we talk about all the other stuff that is related to this class, okay? But it, but it really tells you how useful computers are. I mean, you know, it's it ranges from you know, forest fire prediction and control, all the way to the correction of an image captured by a flawed telescope. Um, and I think they use a lot of that science, the technology you know, involved, to apply that to like spy uh, satellites, so they can now you know extract more information out of their lenses when they are you know uh, scanning over you know the surface of the Earth. Yeah, it seems like that would be kind of easy to calibrate because you just like make a target where you can see what it looks like. You know exactly what it looks like. Take a picture of it with the high definition satellite, and mm -hmm. then just adjust the image until it looks right. Well, that is okay when you're in outer space, but we're but when you're shooting through the atmosphere, you have atmospheric aberrations, you know, because of you know, warm air and cold air and all the other stuff that's going on. Uh, yeah. So that stuff is a lot more random compared to you know just the the flaw of the lens. Yep. Speaking of that, uh, they actually figured out why the Titanic crashed, and it was because of the heat differential between the ice and the water. There was uh, heat, so basically in the desert they. Right, right. That is interesting. That is very interesting. So it's a it's an optical illusion, and they could not. That's why they could not yeah, see the iceberg the early ice, on. So it was like a 50 degree difference or something. So they thought they could uh, blast through it, but it was bigger than they thought it was originally. So the iceberg was cloaked. Something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Stealth bird. Also, I remember hearing that they apparently used a brittle variety of steel. Too much sulfur in the steel made the hole brittle. Ah. So yeah. even if they did manage to shut off the uh, damaged area, it just the damage was just too expensive. All right. So interesting pulling new information out of like these old disasters. Absolutely. Other, uh, well, since we're talking about computer science and all these applications and cloaking, um, there's one thing they can do to, to cloaking, optical cloaking, and this was used in the World War II or possibly even before. Um, in World War II, they used airplanes you know, to take you know, submarines, okay? But some of the submarines can, you know, they, they, when, when the submarine you know, surfaced, uh, there would be people looking out for planes. So when they see a plane coming in, they, they would just you know, submerge. And you know, it would be pretty hard to hit a submarine from you know, when it's already submerged. Um, so what they did was you know, they, have the, um, they have stealth technology back in World War II. And you'll be amazed at you know, what they mean by stealth technology. They installed lights, lamps, along the wing and the fuselage of airplanes that are designed to hunt you know, submarines. So the, way, the, the, the thing is, you know, when you look at the airplane in the sky, okay, you, most of the time you see the silhouette of the airplane, which is dark, right? You, know, you see a little black dot that has a shape of an airplane when it's coming at you, right? So what they did was they installed these lamps along the wings and the fuselage of an airplane, and they adjust the intensity of those lights to match the backlight of the airplane. So from a distance, it is invisible. Okay? It doesn't have the contrast of a, of a normal you know, silhouette. Now, of course, you know, when it's close enough, you can tell, oh, it's an airplane with you know, lights. But by that time, it's already too late for submarines to submerge sufficiently to avoid getting bombed or depth charged. That is uh, remarkably clever. Yeah, I think it is. But, you know, but if you think about what we can do now with computers and also with LED technology, okay, you can quote unquote cover at the, the surface of something entirely with you know, LEDs or something that can emit light. Okay? You know, we're talking about OLED or organic LED. So what needs to be done is for a camera to capture what this thing is supposed to be 
you know, camouflaging as, and then emit the light of that. Then it becomes, you know, kind of more, more or less, you know, camouflaged. Yep. It depends because in, I, I guess in most military applications, um, the other side is from one single angle. Okay, so you only have to appear to be something else only from one particular angle. You don't have, to, you don't have the problem of uh, cuttlefish. <laughs> Put it that way. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is going you know, way, way, way out of the, the scope of this class, but if, for anyone who's interested and think chameleons are you know, in, interesting because they can mimic the color of the background, Look up cuttlefish and what they can do. They will make chameleons look like, hey, that's, that's not even camouflage. <laughs> All right, back to subroutines. Okay, this some is a trace. Days. Yeah, some of these days. One of these days we'll write an app to do that. <clears throat> no, I mean, someday we'll get back to subroutines. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Think of an app that can make your phone camouflage to its background. Oh, they will never be able to find your phone again. <laughs> oh, this is another idea for those of you who want to write apps. Um, I'm sure someone probably had that idea already, but the other day I was talking about, um, we were talk about, talking about privacy and security because you know, your cell phone knows a lot about you. Okay? Especially when you use an Android phone, your Gmail account and your password is already on the phone. Okay? And depending on what you store on your Google Drive, your Gmail, and stuff like that, someone who has your phone is not only gaining access to your phone, the physical phone itself, but it can, that person can also gain access to a lot of your personal information, and they can, in, they, can, um, they can imitate to be you and do other things online until it is too late. Okay? So when you lose your phone, it is much better to have the phone quote-unquote self-destroyed compared to losing that content to someone who should not have access to your personal information. So here's the idea. The idea is if your phone is not accessed, you know, like you know, sign in and do all the correct things every day, it will just wipe its own data clean. So do you know of any apps like that? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. My buddy on has an iPhone that uh, you fail to sign in. Uh, you know, I think he has a shorter or something like that. It just wipes everything. Okay. You can do that on Android or anything, really. Yeah, I'm more thinking about a, um, like what they daily? call a, a, time, uh, a oh. watchdog timer. A watchdog timer, um, ju it's just like you know, the security patrol you know, uh, in movies. Um, you don't, they have to report in every once in a while in order to say that, okay, everything is okay. If a team fails to report in every 15 minutes, then you know something is on, and then you will send you know, back up you know, to that location. So you can apply the same concept to your phone, where you can say, okay, every single day, you know, or every single hour, you know, you can you know, uh, control the timing. Um, there has to be some kind of activity that is legit. Yeah. If you cannot observe that, then you know something is wrong, and it will just wipe the data, and turn on the GPS and report its location. <laughs> so that would be kind of cool. All right. So getting back to subroutines. All right. Back to subroutines. Okay, so this is what we traced last time. We started off with, okay, let me display both at the same time. We start execution on line four because that's the first line out of the definition of a subroutine. The definition of a subroutine does not execute by itself. The code inside the subroutine executes only when the subroutine is invoked or triggered or called. Okay, those are all the different terms to refer to the same thing. So that's why in this case line 4 is the first line that executes because it is the first line that is outside of the definition of a subroutine. On line 5, we invoke XYZ, which means we want to execute the code in XYZ. That's not a problem. Getting into XYZ is easy, okay, because we can see that, oh, this is the, this is the uh, subroutine definition of XYZ, and line 2 is the only line inside the subroutine. So we don't, we don't have any problem tracing you know, onto line 2. The question is, after line two executes, where do we go? Well, you really don't have a whole lot of options here because we know that you know, we are supposed to come back to whatever line is after the invoke statement. In this case, it is line six. Okay, so we are now on to line six. Okay. Line six says you know, we want to invoke XYZ again. 
So we go into X, Y, Z, we execute line two, no problem. But now we have to go back to the line before, uh, the line after the last invoke statement. This time it's line seven. So the question that I was asking last time was, how does this work? Okay, how can we remember that on line five, when after we invoke X, Y, Z, it has to come back to line six, and for the invoke statement on line six, we have to remember to come back to the statement after that, which is line seven. So the question is, how do we keep track of stuff like that? And I was using, um, you know, lending my truck to other people as an example. Remember, you know, every person who borrows the truck has to write down, oh, you know what? When I return this truck to the person who, you know, lent me the truck, I have to restore all the settings to this. Okay. So we are going to extend, you know, that reasoning to subroutines. Now I'm going to use another sheet to do another trace, but this time it is complete. This time we explain exactly how it works. <coughs> we have line number, we have you know, variable x, and the precondition is we don't know anything about x because it will be initialized anyway. So this part of the program is really just there to illustrate subroutines. This part is not important. Uh, we start execution on line four, just like before, you know, which you know, initializes x to zero. And now we go to line five. But this time, we're not going to say, well, on line five, we simply <coughs> go to the subroutine and then execute line two. This time, we'll actually use column C to track something that we really needed to track, but we did not represent it before. This time, right here, we allocate a column dynamically. In other words, this column, column C, was not in use before, but now it is. Okay? So we are now dynamically allocating a column to say, you know what, I need an extra column now because I have this extra information that I need to store. What it is really storing, you know, red line number or pound, is simply you know, an abbreviation of return line number. It is trying to remember when this subroutine call is done, where am I supposed to go to continue execution? So what should I write here into this cell? Six. Six is correct, okay, not five. Because if I write down five, then it's going to do the subroutine call again on line five, and that will become infinite, okay? So the return line number is the number of the line following the invoke statement. So in this case, it is line six. And then after that, I can say, okay, now that I remember where I'm supposed to go back to, I can now go to the subroutine and continue execution in the subroutine. Line one doesn't really do anything. We don't track it. We go to line two instead. Line two says you know, we want to add one to x. x goes from zero to one. And normally, we don't track line three because line three seems to be, well, it's just marking the end of a subroutine. <coughs> is it really significant? Well, in this case, it is, okay? Because there is, uh, there are two actions associated with line three, or the end of a subroutine. The first thing you, know, you want to do with line three is to say, okay, I'm at the end of a subroutine. I know I'm supposed to continue execution somewhere else. Where am I supposed to go? Well, you look up the return line number, and it says, oh, okay, before I got here, I remember that I'm supposed, I, was, I was supposed to execute line six after the subroutine call. So what you do is you say, okay, now I know I'm supposed to go to line six. This six is you know, basically going to this six here. So if I want, I'll just draw an arrow here. And I can do that. There's one more thing for me to do. Once I know that I'm supposed to continue execution on line six, 
does column C still have any value? Does, do I still need to keep it around? Go ahead. Yep, exactly. So what I'll do here is I will indicate that column C is no longer in use. Okay, column C is still there. It's just that you know whatever is there is something that is of <coughs> no value to me anymore. I'm, I'm, I want to recycle it. Okay, <coughs> and the way I represent it is either you know you just cross out the entire thing like this. And recently in you know later classes I use a different approach. I copy and paste this, and then I go to Format Cells and then go to font effects and then use strike through to indicate that th this column is no longer in use. It is still there. It still has a value of six. It's just that I don't need that anymore. So next time if I need an extra column, I can reuse column C. Are we doing okay so far with the subroutine invocation mechanism? <clears throat> if there are no questions, we'll go to line six. So this time on line six, hey, we have the same thing here. We have to invoke the very same subroutine as last time. So we'll go through exactly the same motion. Um, I need to remember where I'm supposed to continue execution. So I'm, I'm reallocating column C in this case. When you're allocating, you're always allocating the leftmost available column. In this case, column C is the left most available column. Because column B is in use. Column B is used you know, to represent uh, variable X. Column A obviously is used for the, the line number. And column C at this point can be reused because on row 7 I used the cross out to indicate that column is now free and it can be reused. Yep. You said leftmost. Did you mean rightmost? It's the leftmost available column. Oh, okay. But this time, the return line number is not 6 anymore because it is line 7 that I should go back to. So that's why return line number, in this case, is 7. And once I remember where I'm supposed to continue execution, when the subroutine is done, I can go into the subroutine and continue execution on line 2 in this case. Line 2 is simple. It's just adding 1 to x. x goes from 1 to 2. Then we go to line 3 again. Line 3, once again, has those two particular tasks to perform. One is to look up. Now, when I'm look, OK, I made a mistake here, sorry. I made a mistake. I made a poo-poo. OK, because I'm supposed to write return line number to indicate it, it is allocated. And then once it's allocated, I can say, OK, it's containing a value of 7. Sorry about that. OK, now that I'm on to line 3, I have to reverse that operation. In other words, I'm looking up the, uh, the return line number that is active. In this case, it's column C again. It tells me that I'm supposed to continue execution on line 7. So I'm going to write down a 7 here just so that I can remind myself that I'm supposed to go there. And I will use a copy this arrow. And let's see, can I yep, I can copy? here because I want to explain why we are continuing execution on line 7 but once I utilize the column it is no longer useful to me and as a result I can now mark and say that this column is no longer in use and now I'm continue ex and continuing execution on line 7 yep go ahead I lost the oh I lost the original one so it wasn't exactly a paste A duplicate. Okay, I think this is faster if I can just draw it again. Is there a way to set it so the arrow is like the default? Um, there may be a way. I usually don't use this for drawing purposes. OK, now that I'm on, on line 7, I'll go ahead and perform what line 7 is supposed to do, doubling the value of x and storing it back to, into x. x now has a value of 4, 
and there's nothing after that in this post. I'm all done with this trace. <coughs> Are we doing okay so far with this trace here? Start the recorder. I sure hope so. No. <laughs> yes, I did. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So, are there any questions about this trace? Because it is the first uh, trace, you know, the first uh, complete trace of what happens when you have subroutines. Go ahead. Then you just drew the, the arrows for our own personal reference. Like we won't need to do that. Yeah. You drew the arrows for our own. Yeah, the arrows reference. are not. You know, yeah, okay. you don't have to do it. Yeah. I was just making sure. Yeah, but in this case, I want to draw the arrows so that people understand, you know, why am I continue ex continuing execution on line seven? And it's because, you know, I remember that earlier before I got into the subroutine. Right. Yep. Mm -hmm. This is the only class, well, I wouldn't say the only, but in many other programming classes, you won't be able to see the execution of a program, especially with a subroutine, with this kind of um, X-ray vision. Okay, and this really helps to explain a lot of things. You, know, you will see what I mean when, when it comes to some later topics. You know, this really helps to visualize what is happening when you execute inside a subroutine. All right, so this is our first or second subroutine example. I'm going to save it and save it into today's folder because you know, we are extending it a little bit here. So we'll go ahead and create a folder for today. This mechanism is universal. In other words, it doesn't matter which programming language you use, they all use pretty much the same mechanism for subroutines. <coughs> use spreadsheet. Okay, there we go. The next example is going to take this one more step, okay, and say, well, if I can invoke a subroutine from outside of a subroutine, can I invoke a subroutine from inside the subroutine? Okay. And does it change anything? Okay. Well, it doesn't change anything. Every mechanism that we talked about so far still operates exactly the same way. But there is one difference. The difference is when we have two, you know, when we have one subroutine invoked from inside another subroutine, how do we keep track of the return line number? Okay, so that's the focus of this particular example. <coughs> so I will say define subroutine. Um, I'll call this one x1. And I will say x1 is x gets x plus 1. And define <coughs> sub. Define sub x2. x gets x plus 2. Okay. And in here, I'm going to say invoke x1 from inside x2. And outside, I'll just go ahead and initialize x to 0. And then I'll invoke, uh, let's see here. I'll just invoke x2 and then see what happens. This is my entire program. Just one indentation. We'll fix all of those. All right. Let's go ahead and save this one. So when you just look at this particular pseudocode, it's not really that much you know, different from the one before, except in this one, we invoke x1 from inside subroutine x2. Okay? And this is what we want to track is, well, can we even do something like that? And if we can, how do we do it? So take a look at the trace. And then we'll try to figure it out. In this class, what we want to do is to understand that a lot of the operations, the operations do not change when they are invoked or triggered in different contexts. <coughs> okay? So in this case, the context of the invocation on line 6 
seems to be different from the context of line 9, but the mechanism is exactly the same. So we'll go ahead and see how they are exactly the same. X has an unknown value as a precondition. That's OK. Where should I start in this case? What is the first line that is outside of the definition of a subroutine? Line 8. Very good. So we start with line 8. It initializes x to 0. And then we go to line 9. Line 9 is a subroutine call. Okay? It's an invoke statement. An invoke statement has two things to do, two actions to perform. The first one is always to allocate a new column. Okay? So we allocate, in this case, the, the leftmost available column is column C in this case. And then we just label it return line number. And the only purpose of this column is so that we know where to go back to when this subroutine x2 is done. Where do you th think I'm supposed to go back to? There are no lines after line 9, which means it's just post. Okay. Once I remember where I'm supposed to go back to, now I can go into the subroutine and say, OK, let's go ahead and perform whatever the subroutine is telling me to do. Where should I continue execution in this case that I'm invoking x2? Line, well, line 4 doesn't do anything, so I typically do not track line 4. So it'll be line 5. Okay? Line 5 is pretty easy. I'm just adding 2 to x. x is now 2. And now we have line 6. This is the big question for this particular example. What am I supposed to do? Well, exactly. We go through exactly the same motion as before. One, we allocate the leftmost available column. And that would be column D in this case, because column C is currently in use. I cannot use it. So column D is now the leftmost available column. And I'm going to use it for the return line number. Where am I supposed to return to? The invocation is on line 6. When I'm done with this invocation, where should I continue execution? Line 7. Line 7, OK? Because line 7 has meanings, OK? It actually has its own operations to perform. So that's why, in this case, the return line number is line 7. Are we doing OK so far in terms of the concepts? Okay. The return line number column is always indicating when this invocation is done, where am I going to continue execution? Well, when line 6 is done, we have to go to line 7, because line 7 has its own thing to do to return from that. <coughs> Now that I have remembered where, I must, where I'm supposed to go back to, we can now carry on the second action of an invocation, which is simply to continue execution in the subroutine that you're invoking. So where should we go in this case? We're invoking x1. Line 2, exactly. So we go to line 2. Line 2 is doing one simple thing. Adding 1 to x, x goes from 2 to 3. Now we're on to line 3. Okay. Line 3 is the end of one subroutine. So at the end of a subroutine, once again, we have two actions to perform. One is to figure out where I'm, I'm supposed to go back to. And then two is to deallocate the column that told me earlier where, I must, where I'm supposed to go back to. OK, now we have a problem, because we have two return line numbers. So the question now is, which one should I use? The one that I just created earlier, or the one that I created? Yep, go ahead. Exactly. The rightmost return line number is always the one that we use when we get to the end of a subroutine. Yep. So the return line number acts as a flip mark. Say again? The return line number acts as a flip mark. The return line number. Like, uh, in this case, uh, Mm -hmm. Yes, it, it acts kind of like a bookmark or breadcrumb, okay, if you remember that story. Yes, okay. <laughs> Sorry? Yep. So it basically leaves me, you know, a, a little breadcrumb so I know where I'm supposed to go back to. Um, and that's why in this case, um, when we get to line 3, where am I supposed to continue execution here? 
find 7. Okay? So it is this 7 here that goes here. When I'm done with, you know, continuing, knowing where to continue execution, I have no use of this column D anymore. And as a result, I'm going to copy and paste return line number and indicate that I don't need that anymore. So format cells, strike through. And now I'm on line 7. I'm continuing execution on line 7. Line 7, guess what, is the end of another subroutine. What do we do at the end of a subroutine? Exactly the same thing. We use the rightmost return line number column that is still active. Column D is not active anymore. It, it has been de deallocated already. So which one is my rightmost return line number column? C. Column C. Column C is telling me I have to continue execution at post. That's OK. That's not a problem. I just have to say, OK, next line is post. But once I have used that information in column C, column C is not useful to me anymore. And now it is deallocated. That's the trace when we have a subroutine inside another subroutine. Are we doing OK so far in this particular concept? It's really similar to what we talked about last time. I you know, lent my truck to John, and then John lent the truck to Peter. And these extra columns are basically little you know, forms for each person to write down, OK, the radio settings are like this. The chair, sh uh, the chair setting is like this. Um, the rear mirror setting is like this. And every one time that I lend the truck to someone else, which is invocation, we have to do the same thing. Are we doing OK so far with subroutine invocation? It's OK? All right. <coughs> So let me ask you a trick question then. If I have 20 gazillion subroutines in the pseudocode, okay, how many columns am I going to use? It's a trick question, remember. <laughs> yep. Exactly. It depends, okay? It depends on whether those subroutines are even invoked. Because I can have 20 gazillion subroutines and invoke none of them. Then I won't be using I won't be using any extra columns. Am I doing okay so far in that explanation? Yep, go ahead. What's use adding subroutines if not been invoked? I don't know. I'm just oh, not invoking them. It could be that they're conditionally invoked. <laughs> <laughs> it could be that you can conditionally invoke and so the condition never happens. Exactly. Very good point. Very, very good I point. Didn't know that statement. Okay. The explanation was it, the invocation can be inside a conditional statement or inside a loop. So depending on what you are processing, that condition may never be true, or that branch may never execute. And as a result, you can still have the invoke statement inside of the code, inside the pseudocode, but for a particular run to solve a particular instance of a problem, that may not even trigger the invocation. So the invoke is there, but you're not invoking. But because you're not invoking, you're not using any extra columns. Okay. Now this is a very important concept, okay? The allocation of extra columns is not because of the definition of a subroutine, it is because of the invocation of a subroutine. Yep, go ahead. This is a form of ab abstraction, right? Yes, it is a form of abstraction. It does relate back to top-down design. We'll get back to that point a little bit later. But first of all, I need to explain the, the, the mechanism of invoking and returning. Are we still doing okay with this one? So let me, let me ask you another trick question that none of you, unless you read my notes ahead of time, should be able to answer. If I have one single subroutine in a particular pseudocode program, how many columns, up to how many columns can I use for return line numbers? One. Okay, go ahead. It can be any number, OK? Now, let's take a look at this next program that will explain and say, well, since I only have one subroutine definition, how can the number of columns used by return line number not <coughs> bound by one? Because it seems to make sense, right? Because if I have six subroutines, OK? A cos B cos C cos D cos E cos F, 
well, then it will take up you know six extra columns. Okay, no problem. Up to six columns because I may not even call one single one. But if I only have one single subroutine of the entire program, how can the upper bound of columns used by return line number not be one? Okay, well, take a look at the next program. <coughs> The next program, if you present the program to another professor teaching CISP 300 or even 360, they will say, what, you guys are talking about this concept you know, this early on? And trust me, you can do it because it's no different from what we have been dealing with all along. Okay, so define sub, I'll call this x1 again. And this time I have a conditional statement inside a um, subroutine. And it says you know, if x is less than, oh, well, we could make it three is fine. Okay. Then what, what we'll do is we'll say x gets x minus one. Okay. Something that we are really familiar with. Invoke x one. And if and define sub. Fix the indentations. And outside we'll have an initialization. X gets, oh, I think I got it in the wrong order. Uh, this is X gets X plus one, not minus, sorry. Okay. Otherwise it becomes an infinite thing. Invoke X one. All right. Save the program. This one is really worth investigating. Okay. There we go. So now we have this kind of mm, interesting program. Is it really interesting? Is there a mechanism in this program that we have not encountered or explained before? It has invoke, okay. Uh, one invoke is on line eight, which is outside of the definition of a subroutine. And the other invoke is on line four, which is inside a subroutine. We talked about those already, right? So what makes this program any more difficult to understand than the rest? Yep. Does the uh, subroutine invoke itself? The subroutine is invoking itself, exactly. We only have one single subroutine, x1. But inside x1, it can potentially invoke x1 again. OK, so we'll go ahead and take a look at this, take a look at this program and see whether there's anything new and innovative or whether this is really just the same old boring things that we have been talking about already. Okay. <clears throat> and by the way, this is called recursion. Whenever you have a subroutine that can invoke itself eventually, it is called recursion. <clears throat> recursion is not to curse someone or something again. Recurse, curse, recurse. And curse is a verb, so cursion has to be a noun, the action of cursing, right? <laughs> That's how computer science people look at things. It has to be logical and it is a systematic <laughs> way of breaking things down. All right, so let's take a look at this program. This time we do need one column for comments because we do have a condition for <coughs> line two. We got line number and one single variable x. Precondition is x starts with an unknown value because I know I'll be initializing that. So, so far, nothing really too mysterious. We know how to deal with this. The first line outside of the definition of a subroutine in this case is line 7. And we are initializing x to 0. And here comes line 8. Line 8 is same as last time. Okay, It is an invocation outside of a subroutine. You know, it's nothing mysterious. Two actions that we have to perform in this order. Okay, first <coughs> allocate the leftmost available column. Column A not used, not uh, available. Column B not available. Column C not available. So the leftmost available column is column B. Okay, we will use it for to remember our return line number. In this case, it is post. Okay, because I got no, I have no code after line eight, so the return line number is simply post. Okay. Good. And then the second action of invoke is to continue execution in the subroutine that we're invoking. All right, no big deal. We're invoking x1. We can find x1 here. 
the first line that does something useful is line two. So that would be the next line in the trace. Line two is the beginning of a conditional statement. And when you're dealing with a conditional statement, it doesn't matter whether it is outside of a subroutine or inside the subroutine, it behaves exactly the same way. So in this case, we evaluate the condition, x is less than three, x has a value of zero right now, zero is less than three is true. So that part is pretty much the same thing as you know always. If the condition is true, we have to go to the then branch in this case. So we continue execution on line three. Line three is adding one to x, x goes from zero to one. And now we get to line four, the dreaded line four. Or is it? Okay, let's look at line four here. <clears throat> Do we know how to invoke a subroutine? What are the two actions that we have to perform when we are invoking a subroutine? Allocate the leftmost available column and mark it return line number, right? So which column should I allocate? Column D is in use right now, so column D is the leftmost available column. Label it as return line number, and we have to remember the line that we have to we have to continue on when the subroutine is done. Now the invoke is on line four in this case. We don't trace line five, so the continuation would actually go to line six. Okay, so this is kind of like you know, a little bit weird because we are not continuing on line five, we are continuing on line six. But that's how we trace um, conditional statements anyway, so it's no different from executing a conditional statement. After line four, we go to line six because line five we do not trace. Are we still doing okay so far with this trace? What is the second action of a invocation? Return. We continue execution in the subroutine that we're invoking. So here we have a little bit of a question here. So should I start from the beginning or should I continue with where we are at this point? The answer is always start from the beginning. Okay? When you invoke a subroutine, you always start from the beginning of the subroutine. So which line should I go in this case? Line two. I should go to line two. All right. So line two is the beginning of a conditional statement. X is less than three is, well, X now has a value of one. One is less than three is true. So now we go to line three again. Line three is, ad is adding one to X. X goes from one to two. We go to line four. And line four is invocate the invocation of X one. Okay, we go through the same two actions again. We allocate the leftmost available column, which in this case is column F. Label it return line number. Remember where we are supposed to continue when the subroutine, when this invocation is done. Once again, it is line six. The second action is to continue execution in the subroutine from the beginning, okay? It's very important to start from the beginning when you're invoking. So we are now starting from line two again. And line two is evaluating the condition. X is less than three is true because X now has a value of two. Two is less than three is still true. We continue execution on line three. X gets X plus one, so X is now three. We go to line four. Is this getting boring to you? It should be. <laughs> because we're doing the same thing over and over again. Okay, two actions to perform. Allocate the leftmost available column. Remember where we're supposed to go to, line six, and then continue execution at the beginning of the subroutine that we are invoking. Doesn't matter which one we're invoking, we just go there, start from the beginning. In this case, it's line two, so we say, okay, x is less than three, let's reevaluate it. x is now three, so three is less than three is false. We skip the entire conditional statement to line six, right? That's the behavior of a conditional statement. It has nothing to do with a subroutine at all. Now that we are on line six, what do we do? Two actions to perform. Look up the rightmost return line number that is still active. That will be which column in this case? G. Column G. Column G tells me I have to continue execution on line six, which will look awfully confusing because now we are saying, let's go back to line six. Because we are going back to line six. We trust the return line number column. 
And then after that, we have to say, oh, guess what? This column is no longer useful. Let's go ahead and mark it as deallocated. <coughs> now we are done with line six of row 19. Are there any questions? Did we do anything <coughs> differently compared to all the other traces of subroutines? Absolutely nothing different. Okay. Now, is it a little bit more confusing? Maybe. Okay, that I can understand that. But the mechanism has not changed at all. Okay. Now that we are executing on line six, what are we supposed to do? Line six is the end of a subroutine. Once again, two things to do. Look up the rightmost return line number that is still active. This time it's column F. Column F tells me to continue execution on line six. Well, let's go ahead and remember that. And now that I have utilized column F, I have no use of that column anymore. Let's deallocate it. Okay. Once I complete the two actions with returning from a subroutine or at the end of a subroutine, we continue execution on line six now. And line six, once again, is the end of a subroutine, so we repeat those same actions again, look up the right most active return line number. This time it's column E. Column E tells me to continue execution on line six. And now I have no use of column E, so I'll go ahead and mark it as deallocated. And then I can now continue execution on line six. So let's do this one more time. <coughs> Wait, yes, yes. Okay, so this is one more time. Yep, okay. <clears throat> it makes it a little bit hard to read because the top part here is, is scrolling off the screen. So I'm gonna have to use this trick here. This is a nifty trick. See this little kind of thick horizontal bar here? When you put your mouse over that, your mouse you know, turns into um, a double-sided arrow up and down. You can drag it. And what, you ha what you're doing here, or what I'm doing here, is I am separating the screen into two halves. Um, well, they're not exactly halves, but I'm separating it into two portions. The top portion and the bottom portion, each has its own scroll bar, so I can scroll one without affecting the other one, which makes it easier to see, okay, what did I have you know, earlier in the spreadsheet when I'm working on the second half? So I can do it like this, and the bottom half can now scroll without affecting the top half. Okay? Very nifty feature for larger spreadsheets or when I cannot you know, use a large spreadsheet or display a large one because I want the font to be bigger. <clears throat> All right, so I'm on line six right now. Line six is supposed to do two things. Once again, we have to look up the right most active return line number. In this case, it's column D. Column D is telling me to continue execution at post. And then the second thing we have to do is to deallocate column D in this case. So we just have to label it as um, free or unused at this point. And once I have done the two things, at the end of a subroutine, we just continue execution as specified by the line number. And now we are continuing a post, which means, hey, we're all done. Nothing else to do. All right. So are there any questions about this code? Yep. Um, is the time complexity for a subroutine less than the time complexity for a loop? Just That's a good question. That is a good question. You know, the question is, you know, this seems like a loop, so does it change the time complexity? Um, so the, I think you're asking two different things at the same time. Okay, one is the time complexity. The, the time complexity is the same. In other words, the amount of time for this to execute is proportional to the, um, to the three or the value that you're comparing to, okay? So whether it's a loop or recursion, it's still the same uh, ratio, okay? So it's still related to three in this case. The second question that you're implying is, but what about the actual execution time? The actual execution time is longer when you're doing recursion. Because a loop doesn't have to allocate, deallocate, allocate, and deallocate. A loop is just like that, right? But when you deal with recursion, every time you go through a quote unquote iteration, which is one more level of invocation, it has to allocate, and then when you're done with it, it has to deallocate. So that takes up extra time, and it also takes up space, because every column that we see, except for line number and comments, 
each column that we see represents you know, certain resources that you have to use up in memory. So you can see that recursion does take up additional resources compared to loops. But that's a good question because now I can kind of segue into something else that is related to re recursion versus loops. Anything that you can write in using traditional loops like pre-checking loops and post-checking loops, you can recast the problem into recursion. Anything that you can express as a recursion, you can also do it in just a plain loop. Okay? But the question now is, why do we have recursion now and when do we use recursion? Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, that applies to general subroutines, right? Which is, which is also what is important about recursion. But recursion has one extra characteristic. Um, whenever you use a subroutine, you're basically breaking a big problem into smaller subproblems, okay? And each subroutine is only there to solve the subproblem. That fact remains with recursion, but with one important point. With a recursion, the sub-problem you're trying to solve looks almost exactly the same as the main problem itself. And that's why you're using the same subroutine to solve the smaller problem. Have we seen anything like that? That the, the, the main problem itself can be seen as, oh, something on top of solving a smaller problem of exactly the same nature. Have we seen anything like that? We have seen a lot of stuff of that nature already, okay? Because every time you use loops, it's kind of like that, okay? But I think this whole thing can be illustrated best by factorial, okay? So let's take a look at factorial. And I'm just going to use a text editor here because it's, it's kind of like a minor side discussion, okay? So we'll take a look at, I'll uh, just give you an, an example here. Four factorial. What is four factorial? Four times three times two times one. Okay. What is five factorial? I mean, you guys know the answer. Yeah, most of you is just been like, yeah, why am I even asking the question? But I recognize something here. When I specify five factorial, I'm seeing a pattern that I have seen already just on the previous line. Right? Isn't that the same thing as 5 times 4 factorial? Do you see how this can be related to, fact, uh, to recursion? Because if the, problem of, if the problem I'm trying to solve is to compute 5 factorial, now I can say, you know what, I know how to solve this problem by multiplying 5 to the product or to the output of 4 factorial. But which subroutine knows how to do with factorial? Oh, it's the very same subroutine that I'm in because I'm trying to compute the factorial of five, so I'm already in the logic of computing factorial. I just have to invoke the same logic again, but this time I say, but I'm not trying to find the factorial of five this time, I'm trying to find the factorial of four. So are we doing okay so far? Kind of you know, understanding what I mean when I say you're breaking a big problem into smaller problems, but, the sm but each of the smaller problem looks exactly like the big problem in terms of its nature. Okay. What other problems are you know, similar to this? Well, let's go to Wikipedia and look up something that I usually do not remember how to spell. Yep. I know I got it wrong. Okay. I, got, I got too many B and then one, too few, too few C's and too many N's. Isn't Google great? I mean, like you don't even have to spell right. <laughs> okay, Fibonacci numbers is like this, okay? So when you look at the sequence of Fibonacci number, it looks kind of random. I mean, it's like, yeah, these numbers do not seem to have much relationship with each other, but they do, okay? Because the way you define uh, the Fibonacci number is the, Fibo the Fibonacci number of n is you know, the 
that, that of n minus 1 plus that of n minus 2. So that means um, this one here is 3 plus 5. This one here is 5 plus 8. This one here is 8 plus 13, and so on. Okay. And how many movies have used uh, Fibonacci numbers as a part of the plot? There are a lot of movies. Okay. Um, what is the last one that used uh, Fibonacci numbers? Hmm? Yep. The Da Vinci Code. And how uh, how was Fibonacci numbers were used in this case? I think it was a password. It was a it was used as a password. Mm -hmm. All right. So it's it's here. What else do you think you know has a quote unquote recursive nature? In other words, the bigger problem can be broken up into smaller problems, and each smaller problem looks kind of like a miniature version of the bigger problem. And this we do, well, I hope you don't, you don't do it all day long, but we do do it you know, occasionally. How do you remove a folder? Well, let me show you something. I'm not going to remove anything, but I'll show you, you know, what I mean by that. Okay, I'm going to switch to a different screen here. This might be good. And I'm going to go to some place where there's a lot of files. There we go. So we now we are now in a folder that has a lot of subfolders. This is program files, and program files has guess what subfolders, right? The, each one is a subfolder of program files. And if I look at uh, code blocks, it has its own subfolders. And if I look at this one, it has its own subfolder. So now we are looking. If you look at the top part here, it is showing you the entire path to this particular folder. So my question is. What do I have to do to delete this folder here? Not that I really want to do that, because I'll be in big trouble if I did it. <laughs> but if I want to delete this folder, I cannot remove a folder unless the folder is empty. All operating systems, all file systems will enforce that. You cannot remove a folder unless the folder contains nothing. Okay? So right now, I cannot remove program files, because guess what? Program files has a ton of little sub smaller subfolders, right? So if I need to remove all these subfolders, what do I need to do? I need to use the same logic, right, to remove a single folder. So I just pick one random one and say, I'll start with this, OK? And I just say, well, start with code blocks. And guess what? I cannot remove code blocks either because it has its own subfolders. All right, fine. I'll pick one to begin with in, the, in here. I'll pick. Uh, you know, main W, okay, or main GW, and <coughs> it has its own subfolders. So I cannot remove this folder yet until I remove all of these subfolders. And I have to apply the same logic again to remove, you know, let's say the bin subfolder. Ah, much better because bin only has files but not folders. I can delete, you know, individual files. That's not a problem. But once I remove all of these indi individual files, I can go back up one level and say, guess what? Bin now has no content. I can now remove bin. And then I have, move, I have to move on to doc, download it, and so on, and do the same thing. In other words, the action or the logic to remove a folder can contain steps that involves the same kind of logic, except applied to subfolders. And that's what recursion is really, really helpful for, is when, you, when the problem is big, but it can be broken up into smaller problems. Each one looks just like the bigger problem to begin with. All right. Are there any questions? Yep, go ahead. So if there's a bug in a sub, uh, in a, um, Recursion? Yes. Is it easier to debug the program that way when it's broken down into smaller compartments? That's a good question. That is a good question. Um, It depends on the nature of the problem a lot. Um, go ahead. Right. 
Now, do you guys still remember pre and post conditions? You don't want to. <laughs> okay, we don't want to remember pre and post conditions. And do you want your final exam to have pre and post conditions on loops? We hate loops, right? You know, loops are just you know really weird things because we have to go back to the beginning of something, and it's really hard to figure out what is the uh, the loop invariant of a loop. Okay, so what if I tell you with recursion, we don't need no no loops anymore. That's kind of nice, right? Now, but without loops, we still have this whole concept of recursion. Isn't, don't we end up with the same problem to begin with? Because in order to prove a subroutine is correct, okay, we have to prove the subroutine is correct to begin with. Because it contains an invocation to itself. So we still seem to be, seem, uh, I mean, uh, abstractly speaking, we still end up with the same problem, okay? Because it's still technically a loop, even though it is not called a loop anymore. Okay. Now this one is kind of out of the context of this class a little bit. <coughs> On the other hand, I think you know for those of you who are curious, you can look it up because I think it's really kind of a cool concept. It's called a proof concept or proof technique, called a proof by induction. Okay. Now proof by induction, and you can you know read it. It's really kind of the concept is easy, but when you look at the actual proof, it can be kind of yeah, tricky. But the whole concept about proof by induction is you look at the first case, the simplest one, okay, and you establish, yes, this is correct. Okay? And typically, that is called the base case. And typically, the base case or the, uh, the proof of the base case is trivial. Okay? It's not even worth mentioning. Okay? And then what you need to do is to establish the connection from case N to case n plus 1. And that's proof by induction. Now, proof by induction on one hand, recursion on the other hand, these two are like twins. Okay? Because one proof by induction is how you prove the correctness of an algorithm that is recursive. Okay? Are we doing okay so far with that concept? And it does not involve loop invariance. Proof by induction does not involve uh, loop invariance. So in a way, recursion is kind of friendly to proving the correctness of something because, you know, because of proof by in, uh, induction. Um, you won't see this again until you get to CISP 440. Okay? But in CISP 440, for those of you who want to get a degree or to get into a degree a program, of computer science, computer engineering, and I think with electrical engineering too, you probably have to take CISP 440, and that's when you will encounter these concepts again. Is that a, um, uh, or what's the title of the class? The title of that class is kind of real, it's called um, Discrete Structures. Okay. But it really is a math class in nature. So yes, it's I, um, that I'm done with electrical engineering. The only uh, other programming class that I have to take is uh, 360? Yeah. Oh, okay. CSUS, right? Uh, no, Davis. Oh, really? Yeah. Cool. Okay. Well, that, that actually makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because you know, anywhere beyond you know, 360 is not going to be material that you are likely to utilize as an electrical engineer. Mm -hmm. um, but I would still say CISP 310 would still be something that could, you can utilize as an electrical engineer. Uh, yes, sir. <coughs> Hmm? That's assembly. That's assembly, right? Yeah. That class actually has a lot of relationship to this class, you know, because of the way I teach this class. You will see all those columns again, except it will be different in that class. I just call it a different name, but it really is it's the same concept. So this class it gives you a little bit of a head start in CISP 310 as well. This class gives you a head start in everything. In the forest fire control. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, pictures of space. <laughs> All right. So I'm just bringing this up you know, just so that people who are interested can kind of look into it and figure out you know, what it is. Uh, the details, I wouldn't worry too much about it. Because if you look through all these concepts here, well, actually, they're not too bad. Um, it's nothing more than just algebra. But it's the application of algebra that makes it interesting.
So are there any questions? Yep, go ahead. So uh, It's related to that. Um, it's just like you know, with factorial. You know, how do I know? How can I prove that the recursive definition of factorial is the same as you know, what factorial should be? So the proof of that is to prove the base case, which is zero factorial, and then you establish. You know, okay, let's say I can prove this thing all the way to n factorial. Knowing that n factorial is correct, okay, is n times n minus one times n minus two, and so on. Can I prove that the factorial f of n plus 1 is also correct when n plus 1 factorial is defined as n plus 1 itself times n factorial? That's, you know, basically you're establishing one base case and then you're establishing the step from one base, from one case to the next. It's a very powerful uh, proof, con uh, proof technique and when it's combined with proof by contradiction, no, you get most of the proofs done in computer science. All right. So getting back to you know the the slide on uh, subroutines, we are now done with uh, subroutine tracing, and we are pretty much done with invocation because we are done with invocation within um, an invocation inside a subroutine definition, and we are also done with uh, recursion itself. Okay. So we are pretty much done with this particular slide. The next one is about local variables and parameters. We don't really have enough time to do that, so I'm going to get your uh, spring break started about two minutes earlier than usual. <laughs> <coughs> have a nice spring break, you know, and I'll see you guys after the break. Don't forget the homework, though. Get it done before the break. I wasn't sure if you got my email. Uh, I sent it to you. Uh, like, I'm not dropping your class or anything. I've just been catatonic this like, the past week. Oh, that so. was you. Okay. Yeah. You know, I saw the name, but I could not remember who, who that was. Yeah, so I did not take role you know, during the entire last week. I just forgot to bring my role sheet day uh, after day. So you're fine. <laughs> okay, yeah. I, I've just been catatonic this sec. And I was just like. Are you doing better now? <laughs> Still not really. I've been going off about six hours of sleep a night just with my other classes. So that doesn't help, really. I mean, you need you need sleep to uh, boost your immune system. So hopefully, spring break is a time where you can catch up. That's kind of what I'm hoping. I think that's what it's for. Yeah, spring it's break. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really though, this is right Go around ahead. the time people start to burn out, myself included. You know how, like, oh, I'm swimming under, you know, grading, you know, this week. So, so spring break is, is good. So do you teach uh, 310? I teach 310, okay. but not 360. Okay. Yeah, 310 is a, because I know in, uh, at Davis, I know for sure that the WE department has its own uh, assembly programming class. Right, but they um, they actually, as far as what they outline, they say that I can take it here and it's transferable, so. Oh, excellent. So, yeah. so even though it's technically not listed, and you can still take it here and it would, it articulates. Yes. Okay. That's why I'm in this class. Oh, so you want to take so eventually, you want to complete 360 and 310. Yeah. OK. That's, that's good. Mm -hmm. Regarding your, your video, they're all posted on your slum props, right? Right. I haven't okay. uploaded the one from Tuesday left. Tuesday yet. OK, so, so that one is to go back a couple of the videos uh, so I can do that. Go yeah.